the message there for me was the deeper we loved, the deeper the grieving will be. So it's a painful, painful process to grieve when there was a very special, dearly beloved person or animal. And in time, it will transform to the gratitude for how much we really cared and loved for this animal. So, If you have ever suffered the loss of a beloved pet, your fur baby, or if you have even been through the grieving process of a family member, our guest today, Liesl Tevisham, has some wonderful tips and tools to help you in that difficult time. Hello and welcome to the Write the Book Inside You podcast. Tips, tools and interviews for coaches and healers like you who want to write a non-fiction book to boost your visibility, clients and cash flow while making a difference. I'm your host, Carol Westmore, a multi-published author and energy psychology tapping book coach. Now let's jump into today's episode. Hello, Liesl. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Carol. So good to be with you. Tell us about your actual work in the world as a, a wellness, emotional wellness coach. You help introverts, I believe. Yes, thank you. So it's a, it's a, we call it a niche, right? It's just working with a specific group and it came to me over a very long time. And so at the moment, I help sensitive introverts, usually who have their own business, and they shy to show up with that. They can help people and they want to help people, but it's hard for them to step out into the world and shine their lights brightly. And so I help them with EFT to overcome those blocks that they may have internally and also with a Clifton Strengths Finder to help them find your their unique strengths because it's when they find their strengths and they can... They know they can rely on it, that, that some confidence starts blossoming and blooming in them as well. That's beautiful. So I presume, therefore, that you are a sensitive soul. And reading your book about losing your Jack Russell shows how sensitive you were and how deeply you were affected. Could you tell us about that book, Liesl? Tell us the name and, and, and the story behind it. Pleasure. So it's Coping with a Dying Pet. I just have a copy right oh, here. Coping with a Dying Pet. that face. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a very cute face. There was a lady who illustrated, who made a watercolor painting for me of a, a photograph that my husband took, and it's on the front picture, so it's quite special. So this book, Carol, actually came about because I, as he was going through his health journey through Cushing's disease and liver disease and two knee surgeries over, you know, with a, between five years, um, I wrote as a part of my own healing and as a part of coping with all the difficult emotions about it. I don't speak easily to people. So I'm more of an internal process of that kind of in introvert thing. And when I wrote, uh, write, uh, it's easier for me to kind of express myself. So that's what I did on my blog, in fact. So I wrote little chapters of this book over time as there was a big story or a big thing that happened or another knee surgery or a problem that cropped up. And I wrote this in chapters not thinking about a book at all at the time. Mm. And then I started getting comments from people and they, they commented on the blog. They wrote me emails, how much it meant to them during that whole process. And then after he passed away, I had the idea, what if I made this into a book? So really part of it was my own healing, just processing all of that difficult stuff. And then afterwards, it's like, hmm, this could be a book. And then I also included other authors who didn't think of themselves as authors at the time, but they contributed to the healing journey for me because they were animal communicators or they were dear friends who also had to deal with pet loss and, and really felt the loss because it was like part of their family. So Liesl, when you talk about Jack, there will be steps that you took during that time. Obviously, journaling or writing was one of them. But could you summarize maybe five or six tips, go through each of them that would help someone else in the, in the process of caring for a sick animal, but maybe it could be they caregiving a family member as well. What would be some of the tips for self-care? Because your, your remit on your website is savvy self-care, savvy self-growth, isn't it? So to yes. be wise about your own self-care, which as you admit in, in your book, wasn't always easy for you. What have you learned going forward in hindsight? Yes, absolutely. Definitely not easy for me because as with many sensitive people, they, they take the cares of the world on and 
they put other people first. And that was the big journey with, with self-care is like, oof, I have to, otherwise I crumble and then I'm no good to anybody else. So one of the tips, um, Carol, is to find a way to calm the nervous system so that we can go through the journey in more in a more resourceful way. And the way that I find incredibly useful is EFT or emotional freedom techniques. So I describe that in the book and I know you've got books about that. So it's a very well used technique worldwide. Millions of people are using it. And so really we have to find a way to literally help calm our nervous system down so that we, we, because I was on like this all the time with when he was ill and uh, there were times when he was ill that my husband was ill and my mom was ill and everybody around me was ill so I it was like a lifeline for me to have that you know even if it's 15 minutes a day where you can just sit focus on your emotions and literally calm the nervous system to just come down a little bit so that's one of the tips another one that I would say is just getting in touch with how impossible it really is to control situations it's a very hard one to learn because as human beings we want to, we feel more safe when we can be in control so we try and control things to make ourselves feel more safe and to to make things go our way and and then we can relax but life doesn't work that way right things exactly. happen i mean Big things of, happen and and one of the questions that people ask is why me why now that you mentioned byron katie w- what is it about what she says that refers to control Lisa? She said there's three kinds of business in the world. There's my business, your business, and God's business, right? And the big things that happen, like my dog got ill. There's a pandemic. Uh, I fell down the stairs a couple of weeks ago. If we ask why me, it's, there's never a good answer to that. Not in the moment. You know, maybe weeks or months later, we can find the answer. But some things like that, it's just, it's God's business. If, if And if I scratch in God's business and I try and figure that out, I get anxious, I get upset, I get angry, I get sad, all of that stuff. And then there's your business, it's, you know, the things that other people do that I can also get upset about. I can't control other people, I can't control God's business. Who can I control is my business, my reactions to things. That's the only thing really. And it's not in our control immediately to control our emotions. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I can't, I can literally not control somebody else or what happens in the world. And that's what EFT is useful for me for is to help calm my emotions and my reactions. It, it yes. regulates us, doesn't it? What I also heard you say in your book is that you, you met a caregiver who has written a book, I think Michael Bloom, and there was something he said about sleep as well. Yes, it was very difficult because as the doggy was sick, he, he was drinking copious amounts of water and six, seven, eight times a night sometimes we had to get up to let him out because we didn't have a, you know, no the cat flap wouldn't let him out. He was too big for that. So emotions were frayed. So really I had to start asking my husband, I'm I'm a light sleeper. So I wake up at the merest little sound. So stages, I just had to say to him, please just, you know, can you, can you do it? And he was always willing and always helpful. It wasn't like, uh, he said to me, no, you know, who do you think you are? And I'm not so keen or willing to ask for help. And I I think, I think that comes through about your personal type and about a lot of the sensitive people that they need to clear some of the inner blocks to being able to stand up for themselves, ask for help. Even throughout uh, your book on Jack, there are times when you reached out to an, an animal communicator, a shaman uh, type journey for, for Jack, and you got messages back from the animal communicator, which helped you on that journey, especially at the end. Can you tell us how it helped to have that message from Jack that he was ready to move on and to release you from trying to hold on to him? Yes, it was a very difficult time for me because I want to know that I did the very best that I could. And it feels like such a huge responsibility to make that decision. Like it's it's time for me now to take him to the vet to go to sleep permanently. And I had been communicating with animal communicator friends over maybe a year or so. And at some stage they told me he's not ready to go. And I could make peace with that then. And so finally, he he started declining a lot. There was a friend of mine who visited, who knew him for about five years or so. And she had not seen him for two years. And she, she was absolutely shocked at the decline. So that opened my eyes because we'd just gotten 
used mm. to it gradually. And then um, I reached out to my communication friends again and I said, please help me. I'm not sure what the right thing is to do now. And I think two or three of them, the replies that I received was Jack, Jack is absolutely ready to go now. It's it's the right time. And things still didn't work out the way I had planned in my head for a year. I thought, when it's time for him to go, I want him to go at home. I'll call the vet here. We'll have candles, beautiful flowers, all of that. None of that could work out. It was the most strange circumstances. Everything that I had planned so beautifully couldn't work out. So mm. again, I had to learn about control. Reassurance from outside of myself that it is the animal's wish. He's ready now. And I didn't have that huge responsibility resting forever on my shoulders. Like, did I make the right decision or not? So that was very helpful for me. And I think that's a message that our listeners need to know. They don't have to handle it all on their own, whatever, whether it's caregiving for a family member, seeing a pet through ill health. It's very important to get support and help because we don't, we can get, go down the rabbit hole of our thoughts, of our wishing to control, to make it perfect the way we see it. And sometimes we need someone to say, just let go. It's going to be okay. And I think what I'd really liked about the spiritual side of your communication with with the people who helped you was that they really showed you, and you can expand on this, the soul companionship that that dog had a meaning had for you in your life. He called you his mom. It's really moving. When you look back on his that time, what had, what was the meaning of Jack for you in your life when it came to that soul companionship? Carol, I think it was almost like a parent-child relationship because my husband and myself married later in life. We didn't have children. So when he came, it was like I could feel a smidgen of what it's like to care for a child. And so I took this responsibility quite seriously. And I think that's part of the journey was was helping me to almost realize how one can take over responsibility for something or some somebody else and how really hard it is to to feel so responsible that, for instance, I neglected my self-care at some stage. I neglected my sleep. I wanted to be everything to him. And it was really impacting my health in such a way that I, I would have crumbled and not be able to take care of him if I continued on that journey. So one of the last messages that I got from him from one of these beautiful animal communicators was, mom, you need to start taking care of yourself again. You need to walk around the block. You need to drink your water again. So he was giving me the messages like, remember, it's not all about others. You need to take care of yourself. And I think messages like that will stay with, with me forever. It's one of my biggest struggles in life is putting myself first. And so getting that from my little doggy companion was very special. Yes, I can see that when you share your story of overcompensating. And I can see that an animal or a child who's so dependent on you can tip you really away from thinking of yourself. Uh, You just, I mean, honestly, I can relate to that with my from what I've been through in my own life, to pull your energy back from being too obsessed and absorbed with trying to heal that other being that you love so much. And there comes a time when you realize they have a soul journey that is not in your control. Today's podcast episode is sponsored by the book Coping with a Dying Pet, My Dog's Last Days, Passing into the Light and Other Stories by Liesl Tevisham. The author tells the story of her faithful dog, Jack, whom she loves with all her heart. As he began to ail and battle with his health, she suffers deeply, but found a way to deal with the anxiety and emotional turmoil, firstly by using the emotional wellness tools she is trained in, like EFT tapping, And secondly, by writing her feelings into articles on her blog, which she later published in this book. You can buy her book on Amazon, where you will also find her other book, No Problem, The Upside of Saying No for Sensitive Introverts. There was another tip which I want you to talk about, which was you were advised to keep something juicy in your life. Now, at one point, you gave up your embroidery so that you could be home and you you were in a terrible turmoil because a trip came up 
at that time you were in South Africa to go to England, but you didn't want to leave him. So tell us about knowing to balance your the things that really energize you in your life, no matter what you're going through. That is such an important point, Carol, and I must say I keep learning it over and over. Because when we go through a difficult time, the tendency is to focus in on that thing because that's the problem. That's the thing that makes us feel unsafe or, or uh, stressed out. So the brain just does that. It focuses in on that thing and it forgets all these other wonderful parts of life. And so we get more and more stressed, more and more focused on the problem and exclude all the other wonderful things more and more. It's just like it can go into a never ending spiral where we end up in such a stressed place that we are no good to anybody around us. And I learned through many, many experiences that it is so useful to keep the balance and keep remembering that Michael Bloom that you spoke about earlier, he he said, put chocolate in your pill box. You know, even if you have, if you're so sick that you take 10 pills a day, just put a little piece of chocolate in that pill box as well. Remember to do something really joyful that brings in, it it brings in different chemicals in our body, endorphins, serotonin, things that can just help us to remember that life isn't all bad. And it's, just brings in a little bit of calmness, a bit of balance. Even in the most difficult situations, it's not always possible to feel grateful about something, but do something that makes your energy feel a bit uplifted because healing doesn't happen in those difficult moments. It happens when we can bring in some lightness. You know, it's like letting the air in a little bit. I, I think one of his quotes was, life is about finding and singing your song. So Lisa, tell us, what is your song at the moment? What 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 is the juicy components of your life in England? Because you've You've moved from South Africa to England. What what right now gives you that juicy, energizing, reviving and recharging feelings? Oh, what a great question. We moved recently from London to Hazelmere out in the country a little bit more. So now we live right, almost right next door to a forest. Mm-hmm. And every day I get my little nature fix in that forest. So whether it's 10 minutes or whether it's half an hour or an hour sometimes over weekends, just going into nature where there's just trees around me. I can look at the green. I can hear the birds. Just feel so rejuvenating, energizing that, you know, the day could have been an awful day for whatever reason. And when I can get that, that that brings my juice back. And the other thing is going around to little villages. You know, it's still pandemic. We're, we're not able to travel a lot. I, mean, I love travel. And so that is a, a sadness for me. But going around to other little villages and looking at the amazing architecture, the old buildings, sitting in a cute tea shop, you know, the cup of tea. <laughs> I just love it. So there are simple things. The things that bring us joy don't have to cost money, but simple things that just lift the energy inside. Yes, I I agree with you. I just must share quickly that during the time of recuperating from my foot up, I can't walk anywhere and I particularly can't swim in the sea, which is my best love. So we just drive to these beautiful spots in Cape Town on a, on, especially in the, on a winter's day that's sunny. And yes, recently I posted some beautiful pictures we took as, as we went on our way to Hart Bay and people are just raving about them. And all I did was take my camera, open the car door, sit there and have a cup of tea. We take our tea. I I make sure Nick is beautiful like that, you know, to take me to somewhere that uplifting and you breathe the sea air and then go home again and just feel recharged. So I'm pleased to hear you say that and to encourage other listeners and people watching this podcast that no matter what challenges come your way, you can always find those small things to keep your life grateful and juicy. Uh, Another tip I think we've covered was breathing. Yes, uh, breathing, you know, we have to breathe in and out. And when we we get stressed, anxious, nervous, all of that, we start breathing very shallowly. And there's a very important nerve in our body, the vagus nerve that people may hear about a lot. And the vagus nerve is the nerve that tells our body to relax, to put us into parasympathetic. When we breathe in very shallow, the vagus nerve doesn't send those calming messages. So we become more and more stressed. So a very good thing then to do is some deep belly breathing. So just lie on your back, put your hands on your stomach and literally try and expand your stomach, feel the rise and fall of your stomach. So we mustn't breathe here in the chest. Mm. Chest breathing almost creates anxiety. You can do it for yourself and and create some anxiety. So when we do belly breathing, it, um, it, it literally engages that vagus nerve and we will start to feel calmer. In stressful times, five minutes of belly breathing, just something simple. You can already be lying in bed just before you fall asleep and just add that to your routine. It just 
start adding little spots of, of calmness in the day mm. and then we'll spill over to the rest of your day. We haven't mentioned meditation, but these are these are the things, yoga, meditation, sweeping the world today, which all help regulate the nervous system and bring us back to center. I find sometimes when I try and meditate, when too much is going on for me, if I don't do silent meditation, my brain is all over the place. So then I just use a guided meditation where somebody takes me on a beautiful journey or I try and take my mind to the forest. But yes, those moments of quiet where we can just calm the nervous system and get away from the frazzle and the running around on the on the wheel of life, the, the rat race, very important because we deal with so much more than we actually realize, Carol. There's just onslaught of things coming at us all the time and we think it's normal. So we, we're kind of used to it, but the nervous system is not quite designed to handle all of that all of the and time. Of course, we know the value of a pet in helping people with their lives, especially if they live alone, you know, what, what is the situation with you in England with a pet at the moment? We don't have a pet right now or renting properties. So it's sometimes hard to find properties that will allow pets. And when we have, because I feel so responsible for my animals when I have them, when I travel, I feel bad to put them in a kennel or to leave with them with somebody. So we've decided for a couple of years now, I hope the pandemic finishes soon, we just want to travel and do all of that and then we'll have some calm and restful times just at home and we will get definitely a cat again. Uh, and my daughter has a dog, which I called my grand dog. And that is oh. my, the nearest I've got to having, you know, my own special pet. But to circle back to a saying you've got in your book that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. I thought that that really signifies, maybe sums up everything that you, a message you have from your book about coping with a dying pet. The Buddhists talk about the second arrow, right? So the first arrow is what comes and shoots us in the shoulder, say, and we have a shoulder wound now. That's like on a literal level. But then the second arrow is what comes afterwards and continues the suffering. And the second arrow is the thoughts, the suffering that we have because of how we think about the thing that has actually happened. So my dog is sick, there's the pain there, but my suffering comes when I think thoughts like this shouldn't happen, I should be able to help him, I'm responsible. I should have prevented this. I should know how to handle this. I, I should find the perfect vet that, that will take it away. All of those thoughts is what brings us the suffering. So if we can find ways to deal, kind, helpful ways to help minimize those thoughts, to calm ourselves when we think those thoughts, then the suffering can lessen. And that is then a life that's easier to live. Brings balance to our human condition. Is there anything I haven't um, touched on that you would like to share, Lisa? Or do you feel complete in telling your story about Jack and the message for the listeners? You know, Carol, one of the things that I probably thought of as I was writing that book, and, and now it's very sort of up for me as well as when I see, oh, I've lost friends in South Africa at the moment. I've I've lost many dear people. My parents are old. I lost many pets over a lifetime. It's it's very hard for us to remember this when things go well, but life doesn't last forever. Not in a person, not in an animal. The message there for me was the deeper we loved, the deeper the grieving will be. So it's a painful, painful process to grieve when there was a very special, dearly beloved person or animal. It's painful. And in time, it all transformed to the gratitude for how much we really cared and loved for this animal. So it's a kind of a two two way sword. Is it, it cuts deep both ways. The love is mm. huge, and the grief then is huge as well. Thank you. There was one other quote that in your book that I loved. You said after Jack left, you said sadness came and passed like clouds under the sun. And I think that will be something the grieving process has to accommodate, isn't it? That it doesn't mm. just go away and you can't tap it away. Allow it to pass like clouds in the sun. Yes, thank you. It was a, a process of ups and downs. And, you know, on many days I felt great afterwards, like the relief was huge that he wasn't suffering anymore. And then the, oh, ouch, but I hurt so much because he's not here and I miss him. And maybe I should have done things differently, you know, all those doubts, yes. all the, the second arrows. And yes, they, they pass like clouds in front of the sun and the sun is still there. Oh, beautiful. So thank you, Liesl, for sharing your heart with our listeners. And as far as writing a book, is there another book inside you? Oh, 
there's many and I'm not working on it as diligently as I want to, but I have many topics in mind. My process sort of works like really slowly over years. And then suddenly one day I just decided, okay, now it's the time and I'm going to finish this thing. So there's a couple sort of halfway finished. Some of them for sensitive introverts, some about other topics. So, Liesl, where can people find you, your books and your work? It, my website is Savvy Self Growth. SavvySelfGrowth.com and page specifically for my books. And there's a lot of free information there. That even some of the articles that I wrote for this Coping with a Dying Pet are there. So your blog post is still there at Savvy Self Growth. And I'll put that in the show notes. And I think your books are also on Amazon. We look forward to keeping up with you. Thanks for joining me on today's podcast. Want a free gift to inspire you further on your book writing adventure? My free checklist, five book hook tips to kickstart your book writing journey will help you get clarity on the key essentials to make your book a winner. Download it at writethebookinsideyou.com forward slash free gift. The links are in the show notes. Until next time, a big virtual hug and keep writing.